it is time for a flashback concerning the aforementioned Dallas Cowboys. The USFL springs back to life on Fox next week. And in honor of that highly anticipated occasion, allow me to tell you my Herschel Walker story about the night Herschel and I went at it on live TV. Understand, Herschel Walker was the USFL in its first life, beginning in 1983. Herschel at the University of Georgia won the national championship as a freshman. He was the driving force. He won the Heisman Trophy two years later. The USFL allowed players to come out a year early, so he went to the New Jersey Generals because he thought they were offering far more money than he could ever make at that point by waiting a year and then playing in the National Football League. And he led the USFL in rushing in 1983 and 85, and he was the MVP in what proved to be his final year in the USFL in 1985. Herschel's propensity for exaggeration took me back, flashed me back to what happened soon after the Cowboys had used a very shrewd fifth round pick on a Herschel that nobody saw coming because they thought he was still going to play in the USFL when heart of hearts, Herschel had grown up a Cowboy fan like everybody does. And he wanted to segue back to the National Football League as a Dallas Cowboy wearing the coolest uniforms in sports. And here he came. And yet here we already had one Tony Dorsett future Hall of Famer, all-time great cowboy running back. Wait a second, you got both of them? And you're going to do what with both? Oh, said Coach Landry, we'll have the dream backfield. Herschel and Tony will figure it out. But Herschel took Dallas by storm. And I'm talking about storm as in what we used to call blue northers, which roared down the Central Texas Plains out of Oklahoma and froze Dallas. Whew. Within like a day, Herschel was the biggest star in Dallas. And the Cowboys were starting to crumble. Rome was starting to fall. This was 1986. But they still had a lot of stars on that team, but nobody as big as Herschel instantly became terrific interview because he'd tell you that pretty soon he, he told us the first media session, I, I want to become one of the greatest golfers ever. Do you play golf? No, not yet, but I will. And we bought it like this guy's amazing because he'd been amazing at Georgia and New Jersey generals. Also said he wanted to become an FBI agent in the off season. We bought it. Okay. And of course, as he always has said, every day, said Herschel, he does 1,000 push ups and 1,000 sit 1,000 push ups and sit ups a day? Man, that's a lot. Seriously? Seriously. Every day. Well, you want to talk about ripped and chiseled and just a paragon of athletic greatness. That was Herschel. He went six foot 225. And I covered some what were called Dallas Times. I was, I was then at the Dallas Times Herald move from the morning news. And we had what was called the Dallas Times Herald track meets, which were winter meets indoors at Reunion Arena where the Mavericks played. And I, I would go watch Herschel. He would go run the 60 yard dash against the best in the world and he would beat them in the off season. So it's not like he was fabricating or exaggerating that he could do it. Herschel Walker took more punishment in those three years with the Cowboys, 86, seven and eight than I've ever seen any running back take. First year he led the league 
in yards per touch that's running and catching because they threw it to him a lot. And the team went seven and nine. And then in 87, a strike year, he led the league in total yards as in obviously rushing and receiving yards, 1,606, and they went seven and eight in that strike year. And then he had career highs and carries and yards, rushing yards in 88, and they went three and 13. So it wasn't contributing to winning, but it did contribute to running Tony Dorsett out of town. And trust me, that locker room was not happy about that because that locker room loved Tony Dorsett the way a lot of players in today's NFL love Odell Beckham Jr. Just in awe of Tony's speed. Tony's elusivity and his ability to make big plays. But Tony was starting to fade and Herschel basically talked him out of town with his 1,000 sit-ups and 1,000 push-ups a day. And the locker room did not like what they thought was gross exaggeration. So several of the players began to pull me aside and say, hey, that's a bunch of baloney, except they didn't say baloney. There is no way he does 1,000 and 1,000. And Everson Walls, the leader of the defensive backs, the great Everson Walls, told me that during warm-ups one day, as they were doing their calisthenics, their stretching, he said, I just leaned over to Herschel and I said, bull, you know what? You're, you're running Tony out of town with all this thousand, thousand talk, and I'm calling you on it because you, you don't do that every day. Yeah, I do according to Everson said Herschel. And yet I continue to hear it from the players I trusted. You got to call him on this. So obviously Jerry Jones buys the Cowboys in 89 and Rome has fallen by then and Herschel's it. He's all they got left. They traded Dorsett off to Denver and he had one last year in him. He was basically done. But there was still lingering bitterness about Herschel. So one day early in 89, I just wrote it, that there are a number of players on this team who just don't believe in the 1,000 and 1,000. Herschel at that point was doing his own TV show. He was on a cable station in Dallas and it was only in Dallas, but every Friday night he did it live. And his producer called me and said, Herschel would love to have you on and he would love to go at it with you about what you wrote about him. And I thought about it. I'd never done anything like that before. And I said, I'll do it. I'll be there. And the producer warned me, this is a live studio audience and they love their Herschel. And he said, you, you, you're going to have to be ready for the audience reaction, but you'll be okay. We'll have your back here. Herschel wants it to be good spirited, but spirited. Okay, I'm game, I'll be there. They booed me off the stage. They, they booed me the way nobody's ever booed me and booed me, they, they booed my very name when, when I was brought on stage by Herschel and his co-host. And I hung in and I fought back and I hung in and I fought back and we went round and round about who told you this? I said, well, I can't give you the names, but trust me, several players told me this. And I, as I left, got really booed literally off the stage and waiting in the wings was the next guest. One of the greatest, if not the greatest running back ever, Jim Brown was waiting in the wings and I had to pass him as I walked off stage. And he grabbed me by the sleeve of my sport coat and pulled me to him. And he said, young man, I was a young man at that point. He said, young man, that was the greatest television I have ever watched. That's a quote from the great Jim Brown. 
greatest television I've ever watched. And I said, thank you, sir. I knew him a little bit, but not a lot. And he said, now I got to follow that. Well, he's Jim Brown. I think he did okay. Now for the punchline. The following day, the Cowboys were flying to Green Bay for a game on Sunday. And for once, I asked the Cowboy PR people, could I hitch a ride? Because it's just impossible to get to Green Bay. You have to fly to Milwaukee and either rent a car or take a puddle jumper up to Green Bay. It's no good. It's hard. And I hated it. And they said, yes, we can work you in. Several media people rode the plane. But this is one of the few days that I flew with the team. I get on the plane, and as I'm trying to adjust in my seat and put my bag under the seat, all of a sudden I feel somebody hit me on the back. It's Herschel Walker as he's entering, and he, he winked at me. He was actually slapping me on the back and thanking me for the night before. So he wasn't mad at all because he also, like Jim Brown, thought it was nothing but great TV. Wow, so I learned something about Herschel. He loved making great TV, and it, it didn't offend him. It didn't make him angry at me. He liked it, and I liked it that he liked it. And I actually loved it, and that was the first time I'd ever done that, and that helped launch my career that has led me to here because I have done that post Herschel many, many times with many, many athletes and obviously many ex-athletes in the debate format on live television. Well, you know, the ultimate punchline to this is that about four days later, the next Thursday, it was announced Jerry and Jimmy and the Dallas Cowboys have traded Herschel Walker to the Minnesota Vikings. A lot of people in Dallas said, what? He's all you got. And then you start looking at the, the hall, the draft picks, and the players if you wanted to keep them. And Jimmy, at the press conference, called it the great train robbery. Love Jimmy for that. And it was. And all of a sudden, Jerry and Jimmy have the foundation to build a dynasty. And those draft picks yielded Emmett Smith and Darren Woodson and Russell Maryland. I could go on and on. There were a couple of swings and misses, but they had so many. It was just hard not to win with that. And they didn't just win. They won three Super Bowls, thanks in large part to the Herschel Walker trade. And Herschel flamed out in Minnesota and ultimately a few years later, it was 96 and 97, he came back to the Dallas Cowboys sort of helmet in hand and, and played special teams for them. I couldn't believe it because he loved playing and living in Dallas. And Sports Illustrated called me and said, we would like you to do a story on Herschel Walker. Do you think he would talk to you? Yeah, I think he would. I, I don't know him that well, but I did have this little clash that seemed to end pretty well. And... I interviewed Herschel and and it was great. And it helped me write a pretty good story for Sports Illustrated about the life and times of Herschel. He's had some tough times, he's had some psychological issues that he's had to work through. And I'll be the first to say I do not share his political views, but in the end, I must admit, I liked him. And in the biggest picture, what I never understood about Herschel Walker was he was so great and he was smart that I never could understand why he had to exaggerate any of that. A thousand and a thousand or top one percent or valedictorian. No, you, you don't need to, to do that. You don't need to fake it until you make it. You, you've already made it. That's what's always perplexed me the most about one Herschel Walker. I hope you enjoyed that video. You ready for more? Make sure you click that subscribe button for all the exclusive content from The Skip Bayless Show. And don't forget 
to check out the full episode of the show wherever you get your podcasts by clicking the link in the description.